this is glycolysis. When we take this glucose molecule, do a bunch of chemical reactions, eventually forming pyruvate, this is glycolysis. And something important to realize is each step, taking this guy and forming this guy, this step was catalyzed by its own unique enzyme. And this step, taking this guy and forming this guy, was catalyzed by its own unique enzyme. Each of these steps required their own unique enzyme. And if you're interested, these are the enzymes. So this step, taking this guy and converting into this guy, required hexokinase. And again, this step, taking this guy, converting it into this guy, required phosphohectose isomerase. So each of these chemical reactions, this guy into this guy, require, each step required their own unique enzyme. But something important to realize is this first step, taking glucose, doing that first modification, forming this compound, catalyzed by hexokinase, this step is irreversible. When we take this guy and convert it into this guy, we do not go in the reverse direction. We don't take this guy and convert it back into glucose. We don't go in the reverse direction. This step is irreversible. However, taking this compound and going in this direction, forming this guy, this step is reversible. Sometimes we go in the reverse direction, then we go forward again, then we go back. So this step with these, with these white arrows, this step is reversible. However, this step is another irreversible step. Taking this compound and converting it into this guy, this step is irreversible. Then all of these steps are reversible. Taking this guy and breaking it into these compounds, and then this guy into this guy, and then this guy into this guy, these steps are, are, are reversible. Maybe we form this guy, then form this guy, then form this guy, then maybe go back, then forward, then forward again, then back again. All these steps are reversible. But eventually we'll form some of this guy, which will again do another step, which again, this is another irreversible step. When we go in this direction, we don't go back in the, in the other direction. But why? Why Why are these steps e irreversible? Well, let's focus on this particular step, taking this guy and converting it into this guy. Why is this step irreversible? Well, it's important to realize is this step catalyzed by phosphofructose kinase, this step is coupled with this reaction. This chemical reaction is coupled with the hydrolysis of ATP forming ATP. So these steps are coupled together and they're linked together. And we know taking ATP and hydrolyzing it to ADP, this is very thermodynamically favorable. ATP into ADP is very thermodynamically favorable, so this is very irreversible. And because this irreversible process is coupled with this reaction, this step is also irreversible and it doesn't go in the reverse direction. But why, why is hydrolyzing ATP into ADP, why is this so irreversible? Well, it's important to realize this at the cell at all times, intentionally creates huge concentrations of ATP and very small concentrations of ADP. So these concentrations in the cell are very far away from equilibrium concentrations. We have way too much ATP and very little ADP. And if you're interested, we, these are the most cells create huge concentrations of ATP. So we're very far away from equilibrium. Maybe at equilibrium, we'd have concentrations like this, where we had less ATP and more ADP. However, at all times, the cell intentionally creates huge concentrations of ATP and very little ATP, ADP. So therefore, taking an ATP and hydrolyzing it to form more ADP, that's very thermodynamically favorable because that's going towards equilibrium. And if you haven't taken Gen Chem 2, don't worry about it too much. But the point is, we're very far away from equilibrium. So these concentrations are very far away from equilibrium. So our reaction quotient is very, is very far away from the KQ, the equilibrium constant of this reaction. So therefore, we know that reaction quotient that's far away from equilibrium affects the non-standard state delta G. So therefore, because this reaction is so far away from equilibrium, then ATP hydrolyzing into ADP goes towards equilibrium. This reaction is very far away from equilibrium. It desperately wants to go towards equilibrium. So when we take ATP and hydrolyze it to create ADP, we're going towards equilibrium. So therefore, this reaction has a very negative delta G. So it's very thermodynamically favorable. And just to really emphasize what's going on, let's say we were at equilibrium. Let's say we were at equilibrium equilibrium concentrations. Then in this situation, taking ATP and hydrolyzing it into ADP, that's not thermodynamic, that's not irreversible and very thermodynamically favorable. If we're at equilibrium concentrations, then taking ATP and converting it into ADP would give us a delta G of zero. That's that wouldn't be that this would be reversible. Because again, we're at equilibrium. So again, I know this is very unintuitive and a very abstract notion, but the point is this reaction, taking ATP and converting it into ADP, this is thermodynamically only because we're very far away from equilibrium. Reactions are, have very negative delta Gs only when they're going towards equilibrium. And the farther they are from equilibrium, then ATP going towards ATP has a more negative delta G.
because it very strongly wants, is desperately wants to go towards equilibrium. But again, simplifying essentially what's going on is again, we know this step, this step, essentially, we, we hydrolyze ATP forming ADP, which is irreversible, and it's coupled with this step, so this step is irreversible. So now what happens? Essentially, now what happens is now we'll, we'll pretty much, we know this step is irreversible. So, so this step is irreversible, so we're going to create a large concentration of this guy. And once we create a large concentration of this guy, that's going to push this reaction forward. Because we know with Les layers principle, if we increase the concentration of a compound, it pushes the reaction forward. It will push the reaction forward. So because this step is irreversible, it's going to create a lot of this guy, a huge concentration of this guy, because it's not going to go in the reverse direction. So we're going to create a huge concentration of this guy, which is going to the react push the reaction forward, creating a large concentration of this guy, which is going to push the reaction forward, and et cetera, creating a large concentration of this guy, pushing the reaction forward. And that's how we push this reaction forward, because we explain how all these steps are reversible. However, because this step is irreversible and we create a huge concentration of this guy, it's going to push these reactions forward. Eventually, we'll form this guy, then again, we'll do another irreversible step. But again, so again, that's essentially what's going on. But what regulates whether the cell does a lot of glycolysis or whether it does a little bit of glycolysis? Well, something important to realize is this particular step, taking this compound and converting it into this compound, this is the rate limiting step. This step is occurring very slowly. All these other steps are fast. This step is fast, and this step is fast, and all these steps are fast, but this step is very slow. So if this step is very slow, then glycolysis is very slow. However, if we can make the step occur fast, then glycolysis will occur fast. So therefore, normally this step is really slow, but if we can activate this enzyme and turn it on and activate it, then this step will occur faster and we'll do glycolysis faster. So how do we activate this enzyme? Well, again, we know we're in a cell that's doing glycolysis. However, if this cell binds to an insulin molecule, it binds to a receptor, activating this enzyme, which creates some fructose 2 6 phosphate, which activates phosphofructose kinase, which makes this step occur faster, and now glycolysis will occur faster. So that's how we regulate glycolysis. Essentially, if insulin binds to a cell, it activates this enzyme, and makes this step occur faster, so now we do high amounts of glycolysis. So that's how we regulate glycolysis. If insulin is around and binds to the cell, then the cell will do high amounts of glycolysis. If there's no insulin, then this step won't be activated, and this step will occur slowly, and, and will do very little amounts of glycolysis. But again, why are we doing glycolysis? Why do glycolysis in the first place? And something else important to realize is we can take other monosaccharides. For example, we can take galactose and convert it into this intermediate. We can take fructose and convert it into this intermediate. And the same mannose, we can also convert into this intermediate. So we can take glucose and all these other monosaccharides, convert them into these intermediates of glycolysis, and then go through glycolysis. But why? Why do we take all these monosaccharides to go through glycolysis? Well, let's do some accounting. Let's say for every one glucose molecule that enters glycolysis, what do we get? Well, in this first step, we lose an ATP. We take an ATP and convert it into ADP, so we lose an ATP. So in this first step, we lose an ATP. How, and in this step, we also we lose another ATP. We convert an ATP into ADP, so we lose another ATP. However, in this particular step, we gain an NADH. We gain a reduced NADH. And then again, so then we take this one glucose molecule, we go through these steps, we break it in half, forming these two compounds. So again, these two compounds came from one glucose molecule. So again, we're focusing the net uh, net products from one glucose molecule. So then we take these guys, which go through these reactions in parallel. But in both of these reactions, we take an ADP and we form an ATP. So we create two ATPs. And the same thing with these two reactions. We take ADPs and create ATPs. So we produce another two ATPs. And something important to realize is one NADH fuels the electron transport chain to create roughly around three ATPs. So keeping everything into account, when we take one glucose molecule and go through glycolysis, we produce a net of five ATPs. And if we were to ignore, even if we ignored the NADH and ignored these ATPs, we would still have a net of two ATPs. But the point is, when we take glucose and we go through glycolysis, we produce ATP molecules, which we know can fuel all the energetic processes we need for life. So that's why we take glucose and mannose and galactose to enter into glycolysis, to create ATP molecules. And again, also, 
Something important to realize is let's say we've just eaten a meal and we have high amounts of glucose. We want to store this glucose. We don't want these glucose molecules to go to waste. So we want to store them in the form of glycogen. So how do we do this? Well, we do the first step of glycolysis, forming this intermediate of glycolysis. Now we take this guy, this intermediate, and we do one quick reaction converting it into this guy. And now once we have this guy, now it can add on to glycogen. Now it can add on to glycogen and, and, and now we have our stored glucose. So again, the point is we take this excess glucose, it enters glycolysis forming this compound and now it's stored in the form of glycogen. So that's how we take glucose and store it in the form of glycogen if through these intermediates of glycolysis. Now, once we have the storage form of glucose in the form of glycogen, now we can break these bonds, releasing this guy reforming this compound, which can then re-enter into glycolysis to either continue going through glycolysis to create ATP or to go in the reverse direction to reform glucose molecules. But again, so that's another important reason why we do glycolysis. When we do glycolysis, taking glucose and other monosaccharides to go through glycolysis, we form a lot of these important intermediates, and these intermediates can enter their own pathways. For example, this particular intermediate, along with being stored in glycogen, this particular intermediate can also enter the pentose phosphate pathway. And this particular intermediate can go through a chem chemical reaction to form glycerol. This particular intermediate can go through chemical reactions to form the amino acid serine. So that's pretty interesting. And this, this pyruvate, which we know can enter the Krebs cycle and it can enter its own pathways. So that's another reason why we do glycolysis, to create these intermediates to enter their own unique pathways. But the point is taking glucose and doing these chemical reactions to form pyruvate, this is referred to as glycolysis. It occurs in nearly all cells. And the primary reason why we do glycolysis is to produce ATP molecules, but we also produce these intermediates.